The NASCAR Cup Series playoff field is set after a dramatic, devastating Daytona night race. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove Daytona Post Race Edition. I actually just got back from the racetrack. I had a wonderful time. Great to meet so many fans. I'm glad the weather was on our side for a change. We have so much ground to cover. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, I encourage you to do so. We recap every Cup Series race on the weekends, and during the week, we cover the latest news, rumors, and drama from around the NASCAR world. Daytona absolutely delivered on the drama tonight, even before the race began with Kurt Busch officially announcing his retirement. He released a very sentimental video, held an emotional press conference. A bunch of 2311 and Toyota crew members were there. Uh, Bubba Wallace, Tyler Reddick, Kurt's brother Kyle was in attendance. Mike Helton, Steve O'Donnell, key NASCAR executives were all in the room to listen to Kurt Busch explain that he uh, will not race in the NASCAR Cup Series again. We could do a full episode, and maybe I will do a full episode on you know looking back at Kurt Busch's career, the highs, the lows, the resiliency. He's still going to be around the sport. He'll still have a role with 2311 Racing, but knowing that he will no longer be driving, that his driving career was you know, unfortunately cut short, hurts to see as a fan, but Kurt Busch has shown great strength over the past year. It was really cool to see a huge portion of the industry show Kurt Busch uh, the respect I think he deserves. We may talk more about Kurt Busch later this week, but for now, let's get to the race itself. Daytona, the final regular season race for the NASCAR Cup Series. The story coming in, the focus was on the playoff cut line. Bubba Wallace holding on to the final spot. Ty Gibbs, Daniel Suarez mathematically still able to potentially overtake Bubba in points. Everyone else was going for the win. Win and you're in. Among the win and you're in crowd, fan favorites Chase Elliott, 2020 series champion. He's been to three straight championship fours. Injuries, a suspension have put him behind in the points, but all that would be erased if he was able to get a win tonight. Alex Bowman also missed races due to injury. Key drivers from key partner teams like Austin Dillon, who made the playoffs last year by winning Daytona. Daniel Suarez, Trackhouse, who made the playoffs last year. Three-fourths of Stuart Haas racing looking to nab a playoff spot. A lot of good cars and good drivers in desperation mode tonight. We didn't get a big wreck, though, until uh, the end of Stage 2. Despite the field's best efforts, uh, Stage 2 was crazy. Two and three wide racing almost the entire time. They settled down a little towards the end until, you know, all hell broke loose on the final lap. But, I mean, there was a stretch where they were three wide, eight or nine rows deep, 27, 28 cars, quite literally under a blanket. A couple moments, guys got squirrely. It was even four wide, like Chase Elliott in the middle of it. Uh, great racing, hard, competitive, but fairly clean up until nearly lap 100. That was when the first big crash broke out. Rookie Ty Gibbs looking to race his way into the playoffs. Spins out in front of the pack, hooks Ryan Blaney, a huge impact into that outside wall for Ryan Blaney. Look at how much it moved the safer barrier. They red flagged the race briefly so they could repair part of the wall. That's how hard he hit. Uh, really unfortunate for a lot of good cars, good drivers, potential playoff contenders. As for what started it, I mean, I guess Christopher Bell just pushing Ty Gibbs in a very sensitive spot. The 54 was probably already a little bit loose. I'd give Christopher Bell the benefit of the doubt and say, oh, it was just a weird arrow fluke. But wasn't Christopher Bell the guy at Daytona a couple of years ago who wrecked like half the field 13 laps in? By making a bad push too early, I guess maybe I can't give Christopher Bell the benefit of the doubt. I'm sure he wasn't trying to wreck his teammate, but uh, certainly unfortunate, wrecked a lot of good cars. For what it's worth, I did see Ryan Blaney after the race in street clothes, because he'd been you know out for a while, uh, go up and talk to Christopher Bell. I didn't hear what they said, but he definitely went up to talk to Bell, probably about you know why or how he was pushing Ty Gibbs at that portion in the race. That big crash, I think, spooked the field a little because then for much of stage three, they ran single file, especially when all four Stuart Haas drivers were able to find their way into the top five. Things were looking really good for SHR. Everyone was kind of minding their own business. But late in the race, green flag pit stops, 
field gets shuffled. They have to merge in with each other. The lineup for the running order got jostled about. A few of the Stuart Haas cars were deeper in the pack. And that's when the second big crash occurred. This one, I guess, technically involved two cars, but really it involved one. Ryan Priest went for an unbelievable ride. Like, I don't know how to find the right words to describe this. You've all probably seen the clip. You've seen the replay. A gnarly, violent, jarring tumble down the back straightaway. Look at this 41 car. It digs into the grass. Look at the air. I haven't seen a NASCAR stock car get that kind of air in I don't know how long, years. His car did like 11 full rotations in the air. It could have cleared a one-story house. Unbelievable crash. Ryan Priest, thankfully, was able to get out of his car under his own control. He was put on a stretcher, taken to the infield care center, then transported to a local hospital for further evaluation. I'm filming this at nearly 2 a.m. <laughs> Eastern time. The latest update comes from Ryan Priest himself. He tweeted about an hour ago, if you want to be a race car driver, you better be tough. Damn it. Fast Ford Performance Mustang, I'm coming back. Ooh, uh, don't know the full extent of any injuries Ryan Priest may have sustained, um, but it sounds like he's in good spirits. So uh, really thankful that it wasn't worse. Uh, I mean, gosh, you just don't see crashes like this one very often. I know we see some big crashes at Daytona. I mean, Ryan Newman in 2020, Austin Dillon in 2015. I put this crash in a very similar tier. I mean, you can see on the replay, it looked like the roof hatch had come loose. Like, this was a violent, eyebrow-raising crash, much like those other two. I mean, after the Ryan Newman incident, NASCAR added an additional bar. Recently after, actually, I think it was Ryan Priest again, ironically, and Kyle Larson had that nasty impact. NASCAR made some changes to the, to the doors, reinforced the sides, softened the front noses. Uh, I'm sure NASCAR is going to take a look at Ryan Priest's car as they would after any major crash like this. They'll study it and they'll see if there are any other changes, safety components that they could edit uh, to hopefully prevent future damage. But I mean, the important thing here is that Ryan Priest appears to be okay after a terrifying crash. I, I can't express this enough. That was one of the most jarring flips I've seen in a long, long time. Like, especially at the very end, the way that car just crunches down, it's flat on the roof, that final before it lands on its wheels, thankfully. That final, oh, like, man, everything about this crash just makes me grimace, quite honestly. Um, but Thankfully, it wasn't worse. Ryan Priest, we don't know the full extent of it, but it, it, it could have been worse. So uh, thankful that Ryan Priest is, is more or less okay. That crash set up overtime. Kevin Harvick, the leader, chose the inside. Second and third place, RFK Fords, Chris Buescher, Brad Keselowski both picked the top, which left Chase Elliott one final chance to win his way into the playoffs to pick the inside behind Harvick. So on the final restart, you had Harvick and Elliott Ford, Chevy, SHR, Hendrick on the inside versus Busher and Brad. Two RFK Fords on the outside. Anyone could have told you who was going to win this battle. No disrespect to Harvick, Chase Elliott. RFK consistently has the fastest super speedway cards in the field. Go back two years ago to Daytona, the first Daytona race with this next-gen car. They swept the duels. They had two of the fastest cars in the race. This year's Daytona 500, Busher and Brad were the two best cars in that race as well. What they could do with just the two of them had the whole field covered. It took, I think, three Chevys and maybe Logano, I think a Ford even, to jump out of line. Four against two. That was the only way the RFK Fords were going to be beat this past February, and that is ultimately what did them in. But two on two, evenly matched. You aren't matching that RFK power. Uh, Roush... Roush Fenway, even before the, the K, even before Keselowski got there, they've always been really good at super speedways. That has not changed in recent years. Uh, Chris Buescher gets his third win of the summer. Brad Keselowski, again, so close, pushes his teammate slash you know, employee. <laughs> that's not a good way to phrase it, but how should I phrase it? You know, driver he owns, that's not a good way to phrase it. it pushes his car. Once again, Keselowski pushes his car, has to see his car win instead of him. He'll take it, though. Three wins for Busher, three wins for RFK this summer. We keep saying after each win, oh, it's a statement, it's a statement, it's a statement. At what point are we not surprised anymore? I think we all continue to write off RFK as 
you know, maybe one of those cars will get to the round of eight in the playoffs this year, especially with how that round of 12 lines up with a road course and a super speedway. Chris Busher could easily make his way into the round of eight if he gets through the round of 12. But at this point, busher has got 15 playoff points just for winning. I think he finished sixth in the regular season standings. I'll have to double check that. If so, that's another four, five, six, seven playoff points that he'll get each round. Like, at what point do we consider Chris Busher a legitimate championship four threat? I'm not saying he's the favorite, but to me, this championship is so wide open. Why not Chris Busher? They're peaking at the right time. They've wanted a variety of tracks this month. I'm just saying, at some point, the statement should no longer be, hey, RFK is looking pretty good. The statement should instead be, hey, RFK is here. Like, as I've been saying for months, they're the best Ford team. This is a team that could win the championship. Like, at some point, that should be the statement. We're getting really, really close. Congratulations to RFK. Uh, big win for Chris Busher Again, just continues to build momentum, collect more playoff points. Brad won stage two, so he got a playoff point as well. Uh, I mean, what a way to end the regular season. I can't say much more. RFK is red freaking hot. Chris Busher winning locked Bubba Wallace into the 2023 NASCAR Cup Series playoffs. Welcome to the postseason, Bubba Wallace. The scene on pit road afterward was remarkable. A ton of media, of course, photographers, folks with boom mics recording for that new Netflix show. Everyone wanted to hear what Bubba Wallace's reaction would be to making the playoffs for the first time. And it was it was smiles all around. Even Michael Jordan came out of nowhere and, and congratulated Bubba Wallace. Denny Hamlin, of course, uh, you know Jordan Hamlin, co-owners of 2311, was also there to congratulate Bubba shortly after the race. I was able to hear some of Bubba Wallace's uh, initial reaction. I'm not showing much, much emotion. I'm mentally drained. This week was... Uh, Probably the hardest week I've had in a long time. Just, just, just trying to stay hyper focused, just stressing out to the max, and waking up at 2:30 in the morning. And you know, my wife's like, "What's going on?" I'm just stressed. You know, and she starts worrying that it's her, and it's not. So it's just, uh, I put a lot to, we put a lot to, to get here. I'm so proud of Moody, Jr., everybody, me back in the shop. You know, we just we bust our ass so much. And it's finally starting to pay off. So it takes a long time, but uh, what's that saying? The ones who wait patiently or something, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Bubba Wallace is in the driver's playoffs, but it's worth mentioning that the 23 team is not in the owner's playoffs. The nine team actually held on to that spot. So uh, while this is huge for Bubba Wallace or his growth and development as a driver, it's huge for his sponsors because he'll be talked about quite a bit more, at least for the next three weeks. The owner standings are what determine how the team is paid out at the end of the season. So Bubba has plenty to race for personally, but from a team perspective, it's not the 23. It's actually the nine driven by Chase Elliott that still has something to race for. So I don't know, Chase Elliott fans, let me know down in the comments below. How, how does that, is that something you are invested in? Chase Elliott could win the owner's championship for Hendrick. Wouldn't be Chase Elliott, the driver winning the title, but the nine team. So I don't know. Let me know down in the comments below. As far as Bubba Wallace is concerned, though, I don't want to move off him too quickly. Denny Hamlin said at the beginning of this year, the goal was to get both drivers into the playoffs. I'm sure Denny Hamlin would have liked to get both cars into the owner playoffs as well, but the number one goal was getting both drivers in. Tyler Reddick was able to make the playoffs last year with RCR, move over to 2311. He should have no issue, and he didn't. He was able to win at Coda earlier this season. Despite the inconsistency this summer, he's in the playoffs. Bubba Wallace is the tricky one. He was 2311 Racing's first driver. In many ways, he's the anchor of that team. He's brought a lot of sponsorship, a lot of attention. People respond positively or negatively to Bubba Wallace. He is a big personality and he's won each of the past two seasons, but they haven't counted towards the playoffs. He's won after the playoffs have begun. He's he's always started the season off a little slow. That 23 team has a hard time meshing. They make a lot of mistakes. They don't find consistent speed. They get better throughout the summer into the fall. And then, oh, too little, too late. Once the playoffs are over, Bubba wins Kansas last year or Talladega the year before that. They haven't been able to win a race this year, but they started off better. It wasn't like a slow progression throughout the season. They've just been decent. They've failed to execute here and there, but they've been pretty consistent all season long, which allowed them to point their way into the driver's playoffs for the first time ever. So I think we've definitely seen some growth 
from Bubba Wallace as a driver this year. I don't have high hopes for him in the playoffs. I think he could get through the round of 16 later this week. I'll crunch the numbers. I'll look at each race, each track, the history there, and I'll give you guys my official predictions. But off the top of my head, I don't feel like Bubba is, is destined for a deep playoff run, but just making the playoffs in year three with 2311 racing, that was the goal this year. Bubba Wallace accomplished that. So uh, good for him, excited for him. Now next year they can set their goals even higher. Keep keep up in it year after year. Of course, on the flip side, you have Chase Elliott, you have Ty Gibbs, you have Daniel Suarez, you have AJ Allmendinger, you have Alex Bowman, Eric Almarola, Chase Briscoe started on the front row tonight, led laps at, at one point or another. A lot of the focus, of course, is on Chase Elliott. Look like we've been saying last week was his best chance. Watkins Glen, his best statistical racetrack, they just didn't execute. Saturday, Sunday, driver, crew chief, team, they did not get the job done. Last week, their destiny was in their control. This week at Daytona, I saw the odds. I know Chase Elliott was the betting favorite coming in, but at Daytona, so much is beyond your control. Watkins Glen was their best shot. They let that slip away in spectacular fashion. Daytona was a crapshoot. We all knew that coming in. I thought Chase ran a a very solid race. Uh, He dodged the big wreck barely somehow. They got on and off pit road during green flag cycles cleanly both times. I think in the second, uh, the final one in stage three, he actually gained some track position there. So this weekend they executed, they did well. It's just Daytona. That's why you can't put all your eggs in the Daytona basket. It's it's just not a a winning recipe. Um, Great race tonight for Chase Elliott, but he needed to win, and that that's hard to do. <laughs> it's very hard to do at Daytona. It really is, um, but I'm glad he went down swinging. He didn't just go out there, wreck on lap 10. You know, they didn't may have any pit road mishaps, driver speeding, anything ridiculous like that. You know, they, they were there. They were in the mix on that final overtime restart. Not much you can do when the two RFK guys get locked up. They're not quite as dominant as the two RCR Xfinity cars were Saturday night, but they're pretty darn close. Let me know how you're feeling, Chase Elliott fans. Again, he is in the owner's playoffs, or the, the nine car is in the owner's playoffs. Does that give you something to watch for these next 10 weeks? Let me know down in the comment section below. Man, there's, I feel like there's a lot more to get to I didn't cover. Uh, oh, I almost forgot to mention that Martin Truex Jr. locked up the regular season championship, I think by the end of stage two. So that's 15 playoff points for Truex. We'll, again, later this week, shake down how the whole playoff picture appears. But congrats to Martin Truex. Uh, did I mention Riley Herbst? I want to give Riley Herbst an honorable mention. He qualified top 10, was leading the outside lane at the end of stage one when he just got rookied. <laughs> He was doing a great job dragging that inside lane up to the front. He was battling for the lead, and then Harvick just hangs him out to dry. You know, not much Herbst could do there. Maybe he could have defended that better, but but he was doing such a great job, and you could just tell the veteran drivers did not want to work with Riley Herbst. They didn't care how fast his car was. They just wanted him gone. So (laughs) I felt kind of bad for Riley because he was doing really well up to that point. Honorable mention to Kyle Busch as well. At the beginning of stage two, uh, under caution, Uh, They had a pit road penalty. I think it was over the wall too soon. Within like three laps after the restart, Kyle Busch was battling for the lead. (laughs) I mean, it's harder to pass at Daytona nowadays with this package than it was 5, 10, 25 years ago. But boy, don't tell Kyle Busch that, at least not in stage two. That was fun to watch. I feel like I'm still missing uh, something else. Um, I don't know. Let's put this race on the groovy gauge. I have a love-hate relationship with Daytona and Talladega, just this style of racing. You know, if I go back to when I was solely a Matt Kenseth fan, I didn't really look forward to the super speedways all that much. Like, I appreciate the spectacle. They were often some of the most talked about races. They had the biggest crowds, the biggest TV viewership. But, you know, I liked all the other tracks where my guy Matt Kenseth could shine and run top five, top 10. We go to Daytona and Talladega and suddenly Matt Kenseth's running 25th where he's getting caught up in some wreck he didn't start. I hated that. Daytona and Talladega felt way too random. And we got some of that tonight. Tonight we saw some of what I love about super speedway racing and some of what I hate about it. Again, that love-hate relationship. I hate how random it feels. Like Ryan Blaney, was on his way to winning stage two, gets hooked out of nowhere. He didn't cause that wreck. He had nothing to do with it, but he's in the wall at like 200 miles per hour. I hate that. I hate that for Ryan Blaney. I also hate to see drivers get hurt. And we see big, scary crashes at Daytona and Talladega we haven't, I don't know if we've seen too many scary crashes at Atlanta yet, but I'm sure they're coming. But we saw Ryan Priest night go flipping, 
He ends up in the hospital being evaluated. I hate to see drivers get hurt, but things I loved about tonight, the two and three and four wide racing, especially in stage two before the crash, were fantastic. And they kept it up and kept it clean way longer than I thought they would. This race was edge of your seat, almost start to finish. I also love, again, the spectacle. Daytona and Talladega are still the most popular races on the schedule. They often draw the biggest TV ratings. They often draw the biggest crowds. Tonight was the biggest Daytona crowd in nearly 10 years. And, you know, I'll be honest, uh, most people won't admit this, but it's true. While we hate seeing drivers get hurt, we do love the danger. I think the danger is part of what sells this style of racing. So, I mean, I go back and forth on Daytona and Talladega, especially now that I don't have skin in the game. My guy, Matt Kenseth, doesn't race anymore. Now I just watch for you know, different storylines each week. I watch for engaging, intriguing racing. I still have a love-hate relationship with Daytona. There are things about it I cannot stand, but I also can't deny how popular these races are. And, you know, I've said this before, but what does NASCAR stock car racing do that no other major motorsport series in the world is capable of. It's this. It's racing three wide, 10 rows deep for 40 laps at nearly 200 miles per hour, inches apart from one another. Daytona style pack racing is unique to NASCAR. It's uniquely part of NASCAR's brand. It's what sets NASCAR apart from Formula One, IndyCar, from just about any other major motorsport series. Nobody else is putting on spectacles like NASCAR at Daytona. I'm not saying we need more Daytonas. I think NASCAR is already pushing it with basically six super speedway style races on the schedule, but I do appreciate NASCAR having an identity, having something that it does well. Tonight's race, again, some of the best, some of the worst of Daytona, but boy, was it exciting. I'll be honest. I'm going to go a 90% on the groovy gauge for this race. When it was all said and done, I think maybe the two fastest cars wound up winning this race. We've seen Daytona races devolve into wreck fests. This race never became that. It really only had those two, albeit big, but only two crashes. The rest of this race, everyone played pretty nicely. I mean, they were making moves. They were putting each other in difficult spots, but they weren't wrecking. And you know, as a fan, I think I, I appreciate that. I felt like I saw driver skill on full display. 90% for me on this race, but I understand Daytona is polarizing. There's a lot to love. There's a lot to hate. And we saw a little bit of both of that here tonight. So I'll be really curious to see where your scores land uh, for this uh, particular Daytona race. I feel like I've been all over the place tonight. Had so much to cover. Again, it's after 2 a.m. <laughs> here uh, local time. So I'm going to get to work editing this. Um, but I think that's it. We'll talk all about the playoffs. We'll look at the playoff grid, how the points stack up going into Darlington. We'll look at all that later this week tonight's all about daytona the 16 driver field is set bubba wallace holds on to that final spot congratulations chris busher rfk they stay hot let me know what you thought of tonight's race down in the comment section below that's gonna do it for me thank you so much for watching leave a like if you enjoyed again subscribe if you're new to the channel and you love all things nascar and thank you as always to my uh, patreon supporters for going above and beyond to support the show. I will see you all again later this week. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend, folks. Take it easy, y'all.